Okay, so welcome. I'm glad you could join us today. My name is Gina Clonan. I'm the founding president of the Connecticut Women's Hall of Fame. For nearly three decades, the Hall has worked to discover and share the stories of women. Our various educational platforms acknowledge the individual and the collective feminine voice. There's no more important time than now to talk and listen. This will be a half hour intimate and informative chat, followed by 15 minutes of your questions, which we encourage you to submit at any time during this webinar by clicking the Q&A bubble at the bottom of your screen. Sorry. <laughs> well, it is, you know, informal and intimate. Hello, right. Mr. Smith. <laughs> uh, okay. So, once again, we encourage you to submit your questions at any time during this webinar by clicking the Q&A bubble at the bottom of your screen. I'll try to get to as many as possible. Our goal is simple, a virtual gathering to talk about today's important issues. We hope this will be a useful source of information while offering up helpful takeaways. We are honored today to have as our guest a master of the American College of Physicians and a former member of their Board of Regents. She was selected by the college to serve as the first woman chair of the Board of Directors of the Joint Commission on Accreditation of Hospitals. After her retirement, she served as faculty member of the School of Medicine at the Eduardo Mondlane University in Mozambique. And while there, worked with the Clinton Foundation and the Mozambican government on the development of the country's successful AIDS treatment plan. She's now a resident in a continuing care retirement community, Ingleside at King Farm in Maryland. Let's welcome Connecticut native and Hall of Fame inductee, Dr. Helen Smits. Thank you, Dr. Smith, so much for joining us today and for talking with us about the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on older adults. Well, thank you for having me, Gina. And this is a whole new experience for me. I'm used to talking to people, but not remotely. Well, but we're I all getting we're all getting better at these meetings, aren't we? I think we are. Um, it, we are <coughs> all learning to communicate in different ways right. and that's the best part about this is that we are still communicating and we're finding inventive ways to do it. Dr. Smith, I'd like to start with um, one very simple question. We've been told from the very onset of the coronavirus that it's a disease of older people. What would you say to that? <clears throat> it's not a disease of older people. It's a disease of everybody with the possible exception of people 18 and under. Uh, it's just that if you look at, to the extent that we, uh, we know, and it's very hard to get good information, you look at the attack rates, the, the amount of the numbers of positive tests, it's pretty much the same from, from about 20 years old on. It's just that older people, 65 and over, get sicker, get admitted to hospitals more, and are more likely to die. And in fact, the older, the oldest old, people 85 and older, that's even more true. Their death rate is higher, their hospitalization rate is higher. But the important point is that people between 20 and 40 are just as likely to get it. And if you're in a family trying to protect each other, the, the, the just out of college grandchild cannot say, well, I'm not gonna get sick because young people don't get it. Uh, that's, that, that's, the issue is that you don't have to be very sick to pass it on. You don't even have to have uh, symptoms to pass it on. So it's everybody's disease. It's, I guess it's our problem as older adults, but it's everybody's disease. So speaking of older adults, so it's clear that we're a little bit more at a risk, we're a risk group, regardless of our living circumstances. And I'd like to know, is that due to our aging immune system or are there other factors? <laughs> For older adults. Ask, ask a good epidemiologist in five years. I mean, we're learning about this disease all the time. There's no question that people with other conditions, diabetes, bad hypertension, heart disease, are more likely to get very sick, more likely to be hospitalized. But that's true of almost any infectious disease. Um, so we don't, we don't really know. This is a strange virus it does some things to the immune system that are different from illnesses I'm familiar with. Um, so my guess, the best guess is 
that older people have weaker immune systems. Mm -hmm. uh, but who knows? We'll know a great deal more about it once in another year or two once we have really good nationwide testing and a vaccine. So as uh, just to stay on this subject for one moment as an introduction, as older adults living independently, which many of us are, besides social distancing and masks, should we be taking other perhaps unique precautions now and maybe in the future as they start to lift some restrictions? Well, I'm sure you've read all the things about letting someone else do your grocery shopping. I still grocery shop, but I keep it down to one store once a week. And I have to go at seven in the morning when it's a special time for older people. So it's really quite empty. And we're in Maryland, we're required to wear masks. So I'm wearing a mask. I like to use uh, gloves, not surgical gloves, the ones people use for food handling. Because that means I still wash my hands when I come home, but it means I've got fewer viruses on my hands. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in the... I think, again, until there's a vaccine, uh, there are precautions all of us probably want to take, some of which I don't like. Uh, I there, was a, a, there was a very interesting article that the, Ch the Chinese have been great about publishing all the data they've got, all the material, so that we can learn about it from them. There's a fascinating article about spread in a restaurant mm. where you had a group of you know, tables of people and it wasn't the, just the people closest to the index case. It was the people at tables where the air conditioning blew the air past the sick person onto the other table. So you had someone quite close, but who was out of the drift of the air conditioning and they were fine. Mm -hmm. None of the staff caught it. But a lot of people who were far enough away that you would expect them to have been safe did catch it. And they, they drew a really nice little map and showed you. And the sad thing is one of the things I miss the most is good restaurant meals, but I'm not sure I'm gonna be comfortable going unless the restaurants, I don't know, really big or outdoors, or, but I'm sure that the, that the air handling is safe. Well, that's an interesting point because I often, I also read something recently out of Scandinavia that's not been peer reviewed, but it talked about all of us exercising outdoors and that actually if we're walking, we should keep a distance of 13 feet. If we're cycling, it was uh, 30 something. And if we're running something else for the same reason that you're building up a sweat, you're breathing, you're, you know, there's an expulsion of your, of your saliva and your body fluids when you're working at that kind of aerobic activity. And, you know, who knows? I think all of these things, as you say, the more we learn, the more we know. Well, if that's a complicated one. I, I'm inclined, I mean, this is the way I was trained. I think outdoors is safer because the air moves very fast. Mm -hmm. um, and so that those studies are of how far your droplets go. And True. I think the things like wind tend to blow it out of the way. So I would worry less about outdoors. I'd worry a lot, though, about about exercising indoors with other people yes. for exactly that reason. All right, so that's a little bit of an introduction to the pandemic on older adults, but let's talk now about congregate living in the coronavirus era. According to the AARP, at present there are over 2,000 continuing care retirement communities, much like yours, and over 13,000, 15,000 nursing homes in the United States. The CDC informs us that over 1.7 million people are living in these nursing homes and 70% of those nursing homes are for-profit businesses. Most Americans know that the Life Care Center of Kirkland is where we first felt the impact of the coronavirus on older adults. What do we know now, Dr. Smiths, that we didn't know then and what have we learned from Kirkland's experience? Well, I guess there's two answers to that. First, um, Lots of Americans live in congregate settings. It's not just, just in uh, retirement communities like this, it's also in apartment buildings. And, and, and sheltering in place in these settings is a little different. You have to be careful in the elevator. You, have there, you see more people, um, but it can be done. You just need to be careful. The, the, the story in nursing homes is much more complicated. I've read 
uh, at least newspaper accounts from the families of what went on at Kirkland, and it's just horrifying. Har Somebody in, in a responsible position said, well, we just thought it was the flu. Come on, the, the flu kills people. They moved, they moved healthy residents into rooms with sick residents so that the nursing staff hadn't, didn't have to go so far to care for them. Totally the wrong thing to do. Staff came to work sick. They knew they were sick. The facility knew they were sick. They were coughing on patients, but they didn't have enough staff, so they let them do it. They didn't close the facility to outside people. They just, they did, it's like they did everything they could to make it spread. It was just amazing. And, but the important thing is the CDC had a very careful look at another nursing home, also in Washington, not so far away from Kirkland, that had one case. And after it had the one case, they took a whole series of really crucial steps and they stopped at one case. They stopped allowing visitors, which is awful for families, but really important. They screened staff as they came to work. They do with that. We've all gotten used to it now, the temperature. On your forehead. Uh, the temperature check on your forehead. Um, they, nobody could come to work if they had a fever. If they had a high enough fever, they had to get, get tested and be properly isolated. They screened patients on a daily basis. And a patient with a fever was checked and would have been isolated. And although they didn't have any more cases and didn't have to, they were prepared to care for any COVID cases in a separate unit with staff who had good personal protective equipment. And those steps really work. It, the New York Times, which has become, interestingly enough, one of my the best places to get data about the virus, says that there, and I don't know quite what their criteria are, but they say that about less than 5,000 nursing homes have had problems. I assume that's not just one, one or two cases, but have had multiple cases. That's about a third of all American nursing homes. That means there are two thirds that presumably are doing things right. And I think it's really important for people to understand the difference. It's not that a nursing home has to be terrible. It's that it's, it's tough and expensive to do it right, but you that's what you have to do now to prevent this. And, you know, we've, we've talked about, uh, we hear a lot about the disproportionate, disproportionate burden on these facilities, and they speak to lack of resources, equipment, staff and testing shortages, coordinated oversight. Um, I know that you're very involved in, in, uh, in instituting measures at your community. Can you tell us a little bit about what you have done that, as you mentioned, maybe Kirkland didn't, but others do? Well, well management didn't, I didn't do it. But right. they, they closed the, uh, the nursing home and the assisted living section to outside visitors about 10 days before the governor of the state told them they had to. They have been testing all staff, when they come into work every day with a thermometer, uh, they actually test all of us, even in independent living. If you go out for a walk, you get your temperature taken when you come back. Now, that's not because walking's bad. It's because they've got their hands on you at the desk, so the chance, chance to check you. But in the nursing home, they, they do have adequate protective equipment. The man who manages the nursing home section says he spends Something, he has been spending something like half his time on the phone trying to, trying to get supplies. There are three facilities in, in, the, in a sort of chain in my organization, and so they're, they're working collectively. But a nursing home is a small purchase of masks and protective stuff, and it's an incredible amount of work to get it. But, but that's what they've been doing. So they, they check temperatures of staff, they check temperatures of residents, Staff have enough protective equipment. Staff have been trained to use it. I and mean, it's really, I mean, having been trained in the past in surgical technique, it's very important how you put on and take off your, your equipment. If you've been in a room with a patient who's been coughing on you, then the way you remove your mask and your goggles and your gloves 
is really important in terms of not contaminating you. So there's a lot, it's, it's hard to do, but you can do it. So in other words, nursing homes can be made safe, right. but it requires real diligence and a lot of people focusing on that. And of course, it, a lot of, I think institutions were just taken a little bit by surprise. Well, Medicaid, which supports a big proportion of all nursing home patients, doesn't tend to pay very well. So a lot of these facilities have been, have had very, you know, very, very tight margins, don't have spare money. They're interested in, you know, maintaining their profit. Now, it's interesting. Both, connect, the governors of both Connecticut and Maryland have thought about this problem. We have some bad, in both states, there are some bad nursing homes. In both states, there have been episodes of nursing home spread. In Connecticut, you've worked out a system where diagnosed nursing home residents with COVID-19 uh, will go to a specific large place with very good staff, with nothing but other COVID-19 patients, very well-trained staff, and plenty of protective equipment. Are those the recovery centers they're talking about? Yeah. Yes. Okay, in Maryland, the governor has set up what might, you might call strike forces, teams that involve a medic, again, with plenty of protective equipment, but you've got a medic, you've got some nurses, you've got a group of people who can go in and take over the managed, so they supervise the, the workers already there, they provide some of the care, and they clean up the problems. Um, so both of those strike me as reasonable approaches to the same problem. I think we talked about in one of our conversations, but there, there doesn't, is, is there or isn't there a consolidated guidelines across the board that all nursing home facilities are meant to follow? either before this started or are they going to do it now? Is there some coordinated it's, effort? Oh, there, I, listen, I, I was working on that problem years ago when I was in government, 20, 25 years ago. Um, yes, there is a, there, nursing homes are regulated by the federal government and inspected by the states. And infection control is one of the important things they're inspected for, but uh, many of the nursing homes with the most trouble had bad grades on infection control in the past. Bad now, the, ex the extreme measures we're taking now for this particular virus uh, are, are a bit different or a bit more rigorous. Uh, but that's because it's been, as you know, 100 years since we've had a respiratory virus to which there's no for which there's no vaccine and to which there's no resistance in the community. And speaking to that, because I was, I was struck by the fact that Kirkland is quoted as saying, you know, they thought it was the flu, which we know kills tens of thousands of people every year. So a statement like that is really quite shocking because the flu right. needs as much attention perhaps um, as the coronavirus does here and here on out. And they're talking a lot about the fall and what that means for Americans around the country where we'll get the flu and the coronavirus together. Can you speak at all to that? What are your fears or thoughts about that? Well, for pretty sex, get your flu shot. <laughs> my, my hope is one small bright spot in all of this is that more people, particularly more older people, will get their flu shots. Now, you cannot work in our nursing home or our assisted living facility here without a flu shot. I guess I think maybe all staff have to have flu shots. They can't order, the re they, they, they can't outside of the nursing facility, they can't order residents to get a flu shot, but we did, we made it easy. I, I chair a, com a healthcare committee of residents they they offered the shots uh, here. Some the Safeway came over and gave them, and um, we were really pleased with how many people uh, got the got the shots. And I'm willing to bet that we get a higher rate this fall, because if if you have the flu and your lungs are weakened from another virus, then you're more likely to get the coronavirus and more likely to get in trouble when you get it. That's a very, very good point. Um, so last but not least, I think 
of interest, particularly to all our listeners, is um, the challenges for loved ones. As you mentioned earlier, the social distancing is really important, not allowing people to come into nursing homes during uh, the worst times of the crisis is very, very necessary. But so we understand the importance of the measures taken uh, that keep us distant from our loved ones. It's been noted, though, that families provide vital monitoring and often essential care in these facilities. Are there ways that we can continue to play an important role? Well, it, that's a terribly distressing measure for fam both families and the residents. Um, <clears throat> and the first thing for families to understand is how important a protective device it is. That is, they're out there in the community, they're exposed. The, the fact that they can't, it's right for them not to be able to visit it helps protect all of the residents in the facility. So people get very agitated and angry about it, but it, it's the right thing to do. Now, I think in terms of what you can do if you have a family member in a nursing home that you've been visiting regularly, is first of all, if you see what you think are problems, if residents aren't being, I mean, if staff are not being screened for temperatures, if staff are not wearing masks, if residents are really all crowded together, there is a public health department in your state, wherever you live, call them up, call them up and say, you don't like what's going on. So that, that's the problem side. But the other side is what it hears, you know, my beloved granny's in a facility and she's a little confused, what can I do? A lot of facilities, and ours does this, a lot of facilities will make uh, tablets available to allow you to do, to do communication, okay. just like us. Uh -huh. And everybody, oh, well, Granny couldn't do that. Well, you know something, with help, Granny can learn it. Uh, a lot of people can, can learn it. So that, that's a really important thing. The next thing that I think is particularly important is, um, Extra staff will be coming in because this is hard work. Sometimes staff end up, end up having to quarantine. So you have strange staff there. Be absolutely sure that the staff know something about your relative. It's amazing. And this is not a, it's not the stuff that goes in the chart. It's a, like write a little message about her favorite animal or cats. Talk to her about her, the cat she used to have. She likes gardening. Tell her what's going on. Bring her pictures of what's going on in your garden. It's the more staff knows about someone's past life, the better they can connect. And so that's that's something you can really put your heart into in trying to, to make life good for the relative that you no longer can visit. And the last thing is, those of us this age grew up with snail mail. We like getting pieces of paper. <laughs> That have things inside them that we so send you know little short notes with pictures and little treats pressed flowers and you know just surprises inside them there's a really a lot you can do to still make it a happy time for people in nursing homes i was speaking with some friends the other day who are actually doing that writing becoming pen pals to individuals in nursing homes and we were talking that it was simp it was as simple as writing a three line joke to make someone right. laugh and putting it on right. an index card and sticking it in an envelope, or as you said, a, a press flower, or, you know, not with most of us in technology, you know, print out something quickly, just fold it up and stick it in an envelope. Right. There's so many ways that we communicate. You touched on something though, that I also think is important. And I wonder if, if maybe this is a reminder we often don't think about, particularly in congregate living and in nursing homes, the burden on staff. We know that a lot of places are understaffed. We also know that a lot of caregivers um, in this country are women. A lot of immigrant men and women present themselves in these caring positions. And to let them know that we appreciate really is a wonderful cycle of care because if they feel cared by you, they can then extend that care to your loved ones. And I'm not sure that we talk enough to the people we expect so much from. That's a, that's a really good point. Maybe you should do a whole session on it with someone who knows that, that feel. Uh, my husband had 
his knee replaced about 18 months ago. And one of the things that happened while he was in, he was in the nursing home for about 10 days for rehab. Um, one of the things that happened is that he had, he had been in the Peace Corps as a very young man in the Cameroon. And he still speaks quite good French. And he had a nursing assistant who was Cameroonian, who had never met an American who'd been there before. Wow. So they used to stay up at night and talk about Africa. And I think there's a lot, but yes, you, you just, they're such wonderful people. The people, the, I, people who come here and learn nursing, qualified to be nursing assistants and nurses from other countries are just marvelous, marvelous. And they have a, an admiring and respectful attitude towards older people in, among their patients, even when they're confused and difficult, that I just think is admirable. It is, and I think a lot of that comes out of multi-generational living in, uh, in developing nations around the world. So they, they are more accustomed, and there is this sense of reverence for uh, older adults, uh, which right. in some places in our country we've lost it, but there seems to be a resurgence, and I certainly hope that uh, what has been called a tragedy within a tragedy regarding nursing homes, that this will... Um, inspire us to do more and make us more aware of what we can be doing and what others can be doing, particularly for older adults in America. I want to encourage our listeners to send in any questions that you may have for Dr. Smith's regarding the pandemic and older adults or any personal questions. She's had a long and illustrious career and has served in many, many positions that we've all benefited from in one way or another. So I open it up to questions. You can simply type me a question by clicking on the Q&A bubble at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and we'd love to hear from you, perhaps one of your own personal stories or questions you may have about what we all can be doing. In the meantime, um, talk to us a little bit about, um, you, talk, you spoke to congregate living, which I'm, I'm not sure that a lot of people, we often think of nursing homes, but we forget how many older adults are living, as you say, among other older adults in neighborhoods and communities in ways that even if someone isn't sick, uh, you know, but during this time, ways that we can reach out to one another because I know that isolation is a huge factor for older adults during the pandemic, older healthy adults who right. are having their movement constricted. What can, we, what can we say about that and how we might help? One of the things that we've really loved. Uh, we've been here four years now in, in, in congregate living. we in an independent apartment, but, but with a number of other older adults, <clears throat> is how supportive people are of each other. In uh, terms of doing little help, giving you help. There was a book in the hall the week we moved in about someone who would feed the cat, and we had to go away for an early, a weekend. Very soon after we moved, she fed the cat. And then when she went away, I fed her cat. But and now when we're all isolated in our apartments, there are people doing all kinds of things to stay in touch. We have, you know, we get together before dinner or for dinner over, over Zoom. Um, we we have book groups on Zoom. We we pe there are people reaching out specifically to the less technologically skilled people who aren't using their computers or we've opened up a closed circuit television program so we could hear from management and from other residents. Um, but there's a lot we can do for each other and it's part of what makes the spirit of a place like this. It's interesting, yes, yesterday they got us to all come out on our balconies and the staff, this was about in the middle of the afternoon, and the staff played loud music and danced for us down in the, in the patio. I love it. That. Reduced, it reduced me to tears. It was just wonderful. There's been a lot of song around the world. You mentioned something which I think might be important for our listeners to remember too. You know, encourage nursing homes to seek um, um, 
technology. Uh, and even if you're in a position to make gifts, you know, a lot of us have older iPads or things that are just lying around. If you give them to a nursing home, they can become, with just one application, like a Zoom, they can be walked around from room to room and can connect right. people in a myriad of well, ways. So we can't move things from room to room right now, but let's wait. I meant the staff, if they had yes. one that they keep in a right. protective No, department. no, I just meant you've yeah. got to sterilize it for all right, we've got we've got a, quite a few uh, uh, things going on here with our question and answers. Uh, one of our listeners says, "What are some of the unusual, atypical symptoms of COVID nineteen that older people exhibit?" Uh, there's been a lot said about that. The, the, probably the most famous for I guess for everybody is loss of the sense of taste and smell. Uh, this is a virus as you probably know, very closely related to the viruses that cause the common cold. So that, that's one thing to look for. Particularly with very old and very fragile people, you may just, I don't know how to describe it, they just may seem not so good. Lethargic. You know? What? Lethargic. Just lethargic. lethargic, they're not eating very well, they're not, they're not getting enough fluids, um, they, it, there's a number of anecdotal stories of people becoming dehydrated and then falling. So if, you ha if, you're an, if an elderly relative is sheltering with you and they seem different, don't hesitate to call. It's, I don't know what it's like in Connecticut, but almost all the physicians here now will do telemedicine. So yeah. you can talk, you can do a Zoom conversation with your doctor who knows the person. And if they think, if they think they ought to be tested, they can be tested. Speaking of, of, uh, of testing, um, we have a question about the vaccine, which is the next step, although away in the future. Where will older adults be prioritized when a vaccine is available and being rolled out? What's the possible criteria for prioritization, do you think, Dr. Smith? Well, it's interesting it's going to, to see who gets to set, set the priorities. I would say the first priority for an effective vaccine is healthcare workers. Yes. Uh, if you look at the numbers, a lot of the spread of the disease occurs in hospitals. A lot of the deaths have occurred among uh, young, healthy healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, technicians. So you certainly wouldn't, if I had, if I was the, the guru, if I was in control of all vaccines, I'd start by vaccinating everybody who does direct patient care in hospitals, in nursing homes, in rehab facilities, everywhere. And then next, the elderly, you know, starting at sort of, you probably start with even 70 and over and then just working down. The biggest problem, obviously, with the vaccine is you've got to produce it. Yeah. You're getting, I mean, the logistics of getting a vaccine produced and shipped and available I don't know how much attention you paid, but about two years ago, when the new vaccine, Shingrix, the new vaccine against shingles came out, there was a long period when we all wanted it, there'd been plenty of literature, and you couldn't get it. No. Our, my, our doctor would get 12, and if you didn't call in the next 12 seconds, <laughs> yep. you didn't get one. <laughs> right, right, and that, that eased up, but there, we went, I can't remember, wasn't a full year, but it was eight to 10 months when it was hard to get. And when then you were supposed to have two shots six months apart, and sometimes you'd get one shot and you wouldn't be sure you could get the second one. Yeah, true. So it's, it's, uh, it, it will be a long time coming. Everyone has- then, I, One thing I do want to say uh, is that I know we're not delighted with the way the Chinese government behaved. The Chinese scientists have been impeccable. And one of the reasons that we're as far along on vaccine development as we are is that they published the genetics of this virus very early, very early. And that's really different. And thank you to them. And that, set, that. that set the groundwork for all, yeah. the, all the research that is going on presently around right. the world, thanks to right. that genetic study. Um, here's an interesting question. I think we all think about this. How concerned should we be about takeout food? Ah, you're a doctor. <laughs> we want to know. <laughs> okay. Do not worry about the food. The food really? itself is not a problem. This is a virus, not a bacteria. 
it can, it doesn't grow in, you know it can't grow unless it's infecting you so it's it's not it's not going to get in your food and divide i mean if the person who prepared it coughed on the food that might be a problem but it doesn't live very long on surfaces so as long as you know the restaurant and you know they're taking reasonable precautions it's fine well, that's encouraging. Now, people do worry about the outside of the bags, how the, how are the bags handled. But again, look at what's going on. Are the people who hand it to you wearing gloves? You know, is it a place? I would, they bring us our food, which I, that's one of the things I like least about being, about sheltering in places. We get our dinners in little plastic boxes. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I be I would only right now use some place that I thought that I knew and that I thought would, was doing the right thing in terms of um, hand washing and so on in the restaurant. But no, food is not a problem. That's great to know. Um, and of course, the burning question that everybody is talking about these days: Do you have feelings on how states should start opening up? What would have to happen to make you feel comfortable about? Maryland back to business or Connecticut back to business? Well, I'm glad it's not my decision. It's tough. I agree with the people who say that unemployment is a killer, that we will, people will die, they will become drug addicts, they will go back to being addicts, they will drink too much. Um, and we, we need to balance that risk versus the health risk. Uh, the thing we want is testing. We want, we want the test we have now, the test for are you infected with the virus, but we also desperately need antibody testing. I have a niece and I have a married nephew who he and his wife both, it sounds to me like they both had the virus very early on. They live in London, and they, but they were not qualified for testing at the time. Well, you would like them to have antibody tests. If they're resistant, that really changes how they can live as soon as things open up again. And that would be particularly among healthcare workers, again, back to the front yes. line to find right. out who's able to take all these shifts and who's able to care. Right, the and I'm sure there are healthcare workers who have, have had a mild case and kind of worked through it, not been diagnosed, but who will be antibody positive. Now, there are people who say we don't know for sure that, that survivors are going to be resistant, which is a little scary. Um, on the other hand, survivors do have antibodies. There are places where they, where they are asking for donation of serum from survivors that is then used as an attempt to treat people who are acutely. Can I just back up for a minute? When you said survivors are resistant, do you mean immune or do you mean yes. that they could get it again? That's what people are afraid of, that this has been a funny virus uh, and that maybe you could get it again. I hope not. And then of course, if you do have the antibodies, we don't really know, do we, how much immunity that's, that gives us? We, no, we don't, but it's better than not having them. And then the pattern, the pattern of all these illnesses, this is a, you know, this is a, there's a lot of history of respiratory viral illnesses, is that eventually enough people become immune and it becomes a chronic problem, not an acute problem. Thank you for answering that. Here's uh, another listener. I agree with what you say about prevention, but there are people in nursing homes and assisted living facilities that are very upset and lonely uh, missing their loved ones. I seriously question the results of shipping them off to a strange environment. I think she's referring to the recovery centers. There will be a lot of fallout from this and some people will die of loneliness. Also, I hear that physical therapists will be extremely busy when this is over because people are not moving or getting help in this area. Staff is extremely busy and some of the exceptional things that staff may be trained to do is not possible. People are really suffering from more than the virus. Comment, please. So one thing is physical activity. You did mention that in some nursing home, physical therapists are still coming in. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, again, I think that's, that's variable by the home. Um, 
but it's important for, you know, if you're doing well and residents um, do not, are not sick from the virus, it is important to stay active. But I, again, I do, if you're short of staff, if you know, the focus is on the sickest residents, you had to move, you had to move res, staff over to care for sickest residents, it, it may, that may be true. But uh, physical therapists are considered an essential part of treatment, and at least in the places I know of, not just here, but others in Maryland, they are still going in. Now, one of the problems is that nursing homes are afraid about any staff member who is going from home to home mm. because that's, that, that's likely to be an exposure. So that, that's also part of, of the problem. And um, do you, are you afraid about states opening up the way many are? I mean, do you think we're gonna see another surge? And then there is this moral dilemma where people talk about, you know, we know there will be more deaths and how we figure out what's an acceptable number of deaths. As a doctor, I'm, I'm sure you must have thoughts on that. Well, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I have great admiration for the governor of my state. Uh, I mean, I had not known very much about him before. I'm a good Democrat and he's a Republican. He's done a spectacular job, including the fact that he recently got 500,000 test kits from South Korea. Wow. His, <clears throat> his wife, I think, is the only governor's wife in the country who is South Korean. So he's regarded as South Korea's son-in-law, apparently. <laughs> That's why they were willing that to sell news. That was an incredible get. Thinking yes, outside of the box. Yes, but he's really been thoughtful and careful. They're being transparent. The numbers are very clear. The, the, both the state and the county website will tell me on a daily basis what, how many new diagnosed cases there are, how many deaths there have been, what ages they are. Um, so I'm confident that a governor like that will take care of us. I'm confident that your governor will take care of you. But I think um, there are parts of the country where people just, I don't know, don't believe in this. I can't understand how you cannot believe in it. If you've seen any of, I mean, are you only believe it's New York City? I mean, I don't listening to, list, listening to there, there's a lot of doctor to doctor communication on, various websites that I follow and the stories from small rural hospitals are just awful. Hard, I mean, people trying so hard, but it's a small hospital and they don't have the resources. And um, I don't see how you can ignore this virus. I really don't. So we need the testing in order to reopen. Right. And I mean, I want my hair cut. My husband had, <laughs> my husband had to cut off the tails yesterday, so I don't today, but um, I would like to go to somebody better, but you no, know, I'm going to wait. Of course. Well, I want to thank you, Dr. Smith, for joining us today for this really wonderful conversation and for all the advice and, and inspiration that you've given us to do more for those loved ones that we have in uh, congregate living situations and in nursing homes. And we'll be sure to think about everything you said and move forward that with that. And I'd like to thank all of you who joined us online. Thank you so much for listening. And we hope you'll join us next Thursday when we're, we'll be speaking about emotional well-being during the pandemic. Our guest speaker will be licensed therapist Joanne Martin, owner of Breakwater Counseling Center here in Connecticut. More information and registration can be found on our website, cwhf.org, under What We Do webinar series. Thank you all again. Stay happy, stay healthy. Okay, so I think I'll end the meeting now, Helen, and I okay. want to just again, people are signing off for coming on board today. It was really special, and I think we, we got to all the topics that we wanted to. Are you happy? Right. Oh, I'm very happy with it. It was a lot of fun. It was. I always like, I always <laughs> like trying new things, and this was a new Great. thing. And tell your husband it was, it was made it really personal when he walked in on us. <laughs> Okay. It was definitely unscripted and informal. <laughs>
<laughs> right, right. All right. You take good care okay. of yourself and we'll be in touch. Okay. Thank you so much, Thank Gina. You, you do a great job. You're a great interviewer. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Okay. Bye-bye.